Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. On this episode of Italics, we will talk with filmmakers Gianfranco Norelli and Sue McCurian about their second documentary focusing on Italian immigration to the United States, Finding the Motherload. We'll take you to Madison Square Garden, where correspondent Lucia Grillo will talk with some very young ice hockey players, the Bronxville Blackhawks, who got to be the Little Rangers for a night. Their previous documentary, the critically acclaimed Pane Amaro, Bitter Bread, about Italian immigrants to the East Coast of the United States, tops a list of venerable films on historical, sociological, and political topics that aired widely on PBS, the BBC, and Rai, to name a few. Their newest release, Finding the Motherlode, a follow-up to Pane Amaro, continues the exploration of Italian immigrants to the United States this time on the West Coast. With us in our studios are filmmakers Gianfranco Norelli and Suma Kurian. The story of Italian Americans in the West is a largely upbeat one. Their stories of upward mobility, of fairly rapid economic success, attainment of education relatively quickly compared to the East Coast. There was a tremendous racial diversity in California starting in the mid 19th century with the gold rush. There was a line drawn between people who were of European origin and people who were Asian, people who were Mexican. That means that the, the discrimination plays out in a different way here. California presented a very complex picture that while in many ways this was an exceptional situation for Italians and for many a guaranteed success, there was still a continuing narrative that described Italians as somehow different and inferior. But because Italians always were folded into the white group, it was also a world of great benefit, where if you did work hard and were ambitious, then it paid off. And that was not true for groups who were excluded from what we define as the American dream. Welcome to Italic, Suma and Gianfranco. Thank you. Finding the mother load. It seems that the Italians on the West Coast had a little easier time of finding the mother load than the Italians on the East Coast. When I watched the film, it seemed to me that there is, and I'll use this term in quotes, less drama in this film than, let's say, or we see less drama in the experience than, let's say, on the East Coast. At one point, somebody in the film says that 40% of the Italian immigration to California was into rural parts of California, whereas only 8% of Italian immigration to the United States was in rural parts of the United States. And so I wonder if the fact of going from a type of lifestyle they knew, rural Italy, to rural California, as opposed to cosmopolitan New York. Yeah, I think that the crucial thing was that many Italian immigrants in California were able to continue to use the skills that they had. Many farmers were able to continue to be farmers, to uh, make wine, or to be fishermen. And these were activities that they knew well, they had uh, a cultural knowledge and experience that they could use to faster integrate in the economic structure of California. And uh, in the East Coast, many farmers, fishermen, were not able to mm -hmm. use the skills that they had. And they had to go, they had to take whatever job they could. Um, also, another element that I think is very important to uh, look at is the structural difference that the two economies had in mm -hmm. California and the, and the East Coast. When the Italians arrive in the East Coast, the economic and the social structure is very set already. There are very, there are many well-established third, fourth generation immigrants from uh, 
um, Europe, from Northern Europe, even from Eastern Europe, who already have, uh, um, um, are very well established. And uh, Italians often found the space for them only at the bottom. Whereas in California, when they arrive, the state is just being formed. The economy is very fluid. Mm -hmm. There is the need of all the skills. And Italians are able to get in on the first floor of this development. And so farmers are able to actually start um, developing what becomes the biggest uh, agricultural uh, development in the United States. Right. Italians are able to uh, develop fruit growing uh, estates uh, mm -hmm. that were very successful and uh, vegetables that here were not known uh, or not very used. Mm -hmm. They were able to really develop the cultivation of broccoli, of uh, uh, artichokes and uh, in general, they, they, they were able to slowly control various aspects of agriculture, not only the growing of the harvest of, the, of, the, of these crops, but also the transportation, bringing to market, mm -hmm. market these crops, even uh, process them. Uh, so canning, uh, Del Monte is a good example of this. And Del Monte in the uh, 1920s was virtually a monopoly they ended up controlling most of the canning in the United States. I think it's also important to remember that, you know, California economy was not as easily accessible to other immigrants who were, I mean, you know, it, California was at that time um, a place that had immigrants both from European and non-European origins, and Italians were welcome as European immigrants, uh, whereas the, non, the other non-European immigrants were not as welcome, and they kind of got the brunt of the discrimination. They were the ones who could not participate as readily in the economy. So, I mean, you know, while, you know, one can't quite say that Italians perhaps benefited from the existence of others, they certainly were more acceptable and welcome compared to these others. In fact, many of the early Italians who come into the southern part of California marry into these very, very wealthy California families. So immediately they have access to, you know, the highest levels of the social structure. They have access to land. Um, many of them even change their names uh, quite early on. Just uh, Giovanni Leandri who becomes Juan Leandri. So, I mean, s s historians talk about the difficulty of even locating the Italians because they kind of disappear into the California society quite quickly and easily. In the south. In the, in the south. south. In the south, right. yeah. But it wasn't all rosy. There were also mining accidents. There were a lot of Italian immigrants who did that type of hard work and didn't get the recognition, and, and, and many who also were victims of these types of accidents. Yeah, in the film, we tell the story of the Argonaut mine disaster, uh, where 40 miners got trapped by a gas explosion and uh, they die, they're not rescued in time, and half of them were Italian immigrants. That also is another interesting uh, aspect of the immigration. There were clearly two faces. The first group of the Italian pioneers that started arriving with the gold rush uh, really were very successful, were able to buy land, develop businesses. But the second wave that came 20, 30, 40 years later uh, were mostly single men, not skilled, and they ended up doing the jobs like working in the mines, the most dangerous jobs. They were uh, uprooted from their communities. They didn't really, they kept moving from one place to another, finding jobs uh, that, uh, that they could uh, uh, do, and uh, they ended up not being as successful as the first wave of immigrants. Their experience was more similar to uh, a lot of the experiences in the East. The film takes us on a journey from Northern California all the way down really to San Diego. What difference did you find between the North and the South? The Northern communities were perhaps larger and established earlier. You know, so there is this phenomenon of large numbers of Italians coming during the gold rush. The establishment of San Francisco as this major center of Italian culture, economic power, prominence. Um, whereas in the South, the few that arrive in Los Angeles, for example, almost kind of disappear and blend into a California culture. Um, and it, they're much more 
in, in L.A., the experience is that they're much more scattered throughout. So there isn't a co kind of a conglomeration and a, and a center of Italian power. LA, Los Angeles was also very different from San Francisco and not as, um, you know, not as welcoming of um, immigrants later on, you know, uh, with the, you know, the post-California uh, era when, when it became part of. So, um, you know, we talk about the, the immigrants, the Italian immigrants who work through in the, at the Italian hall and that there's a kind of a struggle right. for rights and, you know, difficult working conditions that they work under. And, and I think we forget that, you know, that there was, we, we were very familiar with the sort of uh, unionization, uh, uh, the, the sort of anarchists, the socialists, et cetera, in the Northeast. We forget that there were also people on the West Coast, Italians on the West Coast who were engaging in the same struggles. So you mentioned the Italian Hall, which was built in, I think, 1905, and yeah. which served, in fact, as a meeting place. And not only for act, labor activists who were Italian, but other for, labor yeah, activists. Yeah, there were yeah. the famous yeah. brothers. The Magon brothers. The Magon brothers. Who were, who were um, yeah, major Mexican revolutionaries right. who found refuge there. And also in San Francisco. I mean, you know, we talk about the early free speech fights um, you know, you tend to kind of not remember that there was this um, secular anti-clerical soul you know, to the Italian society. There's a wonderful vignette in the film, uh, the woman from Southern California who ends up working um, for the war effort. She quits high school because she wants to be independent, whatever, and go out and get a job and, and eventually ends up as a young woman still working during the war effort um, and, and goes to school and becomes an electrician and works on these bombers, right? And, and there's a wonderful uh, conversation she recounts about her and her father. I had heard on the radio that they were hiring at uh, Convair. And so I went to the night school for four months and I learned to be an electrician. I worked on the B-24s and I put electrical conduits from the tail gunner all the way up to the pilot. I liked my job. I felt like I was contributing to the war effort and helping my family. When I got my first paycheck, I was astounded. It was $45. I, I had never seen $45 in one lump in my life. My father came home and he confronted me with the question, what am I doing in a bar? His daughter was in a bar without a, an escort. And I said, I take care of the family and I buy our clothes and I buy our food. And I said, I think I have a right to go anywhere I please. And I waited because I thought, well, this is the end of my life. You know? He just backed off and he looked at me and he walked away and he says, I'm finished. You do what you want. We thought that that was very symbolic of uh, the tensions between the first generation that, that still maintains all the, the cultural heritage of Italy and all its uh, difficulty adjusting to a new society and the children of the immigrants who are born with a new perspective and have to fight every step of the way and young women have to struggle even more than men right. within the traditional society. One of the things we do consistently in the film is to look at women's roles. I mean, you know, there's been quite a bit done about what the West made possible for women in general, because they had to take on roles that they might not have taken on in, in other kind of, in, in, in urban settings, for example, you know, as wives of farmers, wives of miners who die. So the women kind of take on the role of being, they become business women and very, very successful business women. Um, the women in, in San Francisco organize themselves into a, into a union and they don't want to be a part of the men's union. They want a union of their own. Um, the women in Sicily and women in Monterey who are the ones who buy the real estate and kind of say, okay, now we're going to settle here and live here. Whereas you know, the men are out at sea and the women have to take on a role. That was very striking. And one of the things they also do pretty early on is create kind of occupational associations. 
So, I mean, the scavengers, for example, which is a fascinating story. And, and we meet this fifth-generation Ligurian scavenger, this young man who's still working for the Scavengers Association in, um, in San Francisco. They very, very early on decided to form a, a union, which also gave, got, gave, and managed to get a charter from the city, which gave them a kind of a monopoly on where they would c collect garbage. But it, the money they make is not from collecting garbage. It's from recycling and selling. And they so recycled everything, you know, buttons and cloth and whatever. And these occupations, in many cases, go from one generation to the other. It certainly happens with the winemakers, with the scavengers, with farmers. And of course, along with this kind of goes a very strong sense of occupational identity. They're farmers, they're winemakers, they're fishermen. And um, there are, and this, in the case of the fishermen, as fishing disappears, they can no longer be fishermen. And so there are people who talk with great sadness about the destruction of that um, occupation but also their loss of sense of identity. Sam Rodia. Mm. When you were saying scavengers, I was thinking of how he built sure. the Watts Towers. With uh, found objects. With found objects. Discarded objects. Exactly. He built these uh, three towers and a lot of other structures around them um, in the uh, neighborhood of Watts near Lo in Los Angeles. And they became a museum, an art center, and now this legacy of the builder of the Italian um, you know, the, the, this uh, uh, diminutive uh, man who made everything with his hands by himself in 30 years, this legacy remains in that neighborhood and was picked up by the Latinos and the African Americans yeah, who yeah. lived there. And uh, it's quite moving to see a man with virtually no formal education that was able to, to build these structures uh, that remain today still strong and beautiful. Yeah. One of the interesting things about the radio story is that, of course, it's, it's that his legacy is being maintained and by another community, by not an Italian-American community, because Italian-Americans no, no longer live there. And this, I think, happens in a lot of communities, in a lot of immigrant communities. Immigrant heritage, immigrant legacies that are brought over by one community is then passed on to another one, transmitted to another one, and then maintained um, and enriched by another. And that, if you will, is the American story. Um, and that we thought was a very nice way of ending to kind of r realize that what we bring from our heritage is often passed on and that makes for a richer social yeah, structure. People come to the White Towers Art Center and learn how to tile, simply because that's what Simon did. Right across the street is Don Jose's wall. We tile that whole wall. We taught our children how to do it. We teach our neighbors how to do it. And we continue that tradition of recycling with thrown away objects. Art is, I think, the one area where we can communicate with each other when we cannot communicate with each other any other way. So much about the towers have to do with migration. The place of ships in the migrants' memory. He called it the ship of Columbus. This image of the seafaring Italian going all over the world. The Watts Towers are a magnificent testimony to an immigrant who did really not find the American dream, but somehow found the inner resources and the skills and the determination to do something big, to be seen. Our viewers will get a chance to see the film on February 27th. And in the meantime, I want to thank you too. Thank you, thank you very much. much. As many tuned in at home or crowded the world's most famous arena, for the New York Rangers' final home game before players joined the Winter Olympics in Sochi, we at Italics thought we'd bring you some winter sports a little closer to home and a view towards a bright future in sports, represented in part by a third generation of Italian-Americans. Earlier this month, we went to the famed Madison Square Garden for New York Rangers' youth hockey night, during which a select team of children has the opportunity to play on Ranger ice. Correspondent Lucia Grillo takes us to the garden 
to be part of the glorious moment and to hear from the athletes themselves. Let's go to Lucia Grillo at Madison Square Garden. All right, let's go. Rangers on three. Ready? One, two, three. Rangers! I'm Lucia Grillo with Italics. We're at Madison Square Garden to watch the Bronxville Blackhawks Youth Hockey League play during the Rangers halftime. The league is comprised of seven and eight year olds who have traveled from Westchester to play in Manhattan. They might be very young, but their dedication is tremendous. Waking as early as 4.30 a.m. on weekends and committing their weekday evenings, staying up later than many of their peers. The Bronxville Blackhawks, tonight known as the Little Rangers, is a traveling youth ice hockey league comprised of seven and eight year olds who sometimes travel out of their county and even out of state to compete as far as New Jersey and Connecticut. Let's hear from them. Can you tell us a little bit about your team? Well, we're really good. We don't lose a lot. We're in first place. Tell us some Italian words. I only know ciao. And what does that mean? Hi and goodbye. Uh -huh. I think you know some other ones like pizza. Ooh. <laughs> spaghetti. I don't really know it. You don't know spaghetti? Pasta? You don't eat spaghetti? Oh, I do. <laughs> I'm only Italian because of my grandpa. Uh -huh. And that he only taught me, he taught me a lot of words, but I can only remember ciao. Oh, that's a good word to remember. It's a great place to start. Yeah. So are you excited for tonight? Yeah. What makes it so special? That I get to skate on the Rangers ice. All right, well, you go get them on the ice. Okay. How long have you been playing hockey? Since I was two and a half. And did you, have you been playing with a lot of the other guys on the team since then? Yes. Who else, who else have you been playing with? Nicholas and Jason. How do you feel about playing at Madison Square Garden tonight? Good, really good. Yeah. It's what? fun. What's, uh, what makes it so exciting? That we get to play on the ice and we get to skate and people watch us. And is it, is it important, is it, does it make it more exciting that you're at MSG or do you just, are you just happy to play wherever you can? Happy to play where I am. And your family, at least part of it, comes from Italy, right? Do you act Italian at home or? No, I do not. Do you know any Italian words? See, uh -huh. um, expect that means wait. Great talking to you. Yeah, thank you. What are you doing here tonight? The skate on Madison Square Garden. Uh -huh. What, um, how does it feel? It feels good. Yeah? What, what makes it so special? Uh... <laughs> What inspired you to start playing hockey? My dad. Did he play hockey? Yes. Yeah. And how, how old were you when you started playing hockey? Two years old. Wow, that's a long time. How old are you now? Eight. And um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Professional hockey player. So you're starting at the right place. Yeah. Now, your family is Italian-American. Yes. Yeah. And so what, what does that mean? I'm going to play it for the U.S. team. <laughs> Do you, um, can you tell us some Italian words? No. You don't know any Italian words? Not even pizza? Just bad words. <laughs> you, know, you know bad words in Italian? What else do you know? Ciao. Oh. Do you have a special trick that you do on the ice? I think so. I don't know. Ciao. What? A shot. Oh, yeah? You make a lot of goals? Yes. How many goals have you made so far this year? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Stefano, it's great to have you on the show. Thank, thank you for having me. Yeah. Are you excited? Yes. What makes it so exciting for you? It makes it so excited for, for to skate on the Rangers ice. Do you hope to play here when you're an adult? Yes. Is that what you want to be when you grow up, a hockey player? Yes. Wow. Do most of your teammates want to be that? Yes. Cool. You think you'll all be playing on the Rangers when you're big together? I don't know. <laughs> how long have you been playing hockey? Uh, for like three years. Uh -huh. Since you were, how old are you now? I'm eight. Uh, how did you get into it? I got into it by, by watching the NHL and then I decided I wanted to play hockey. And your family is from Italy? Yes. Who, which do you know which of your family came from Italy? Uh, yes. Who came? My grandpa came from Italy. 
on my dad's side. How are you feeling about tonight? Really excited. Are you a Rangers fan? Yes. Do you have any special moves that you do on the ice? I do deeks in front of the goalies. How did you learn that? Um, I teached it myself. Really? Right. Wow, fantastic. How long have you been playing hockey? Uh, I started three or four. Oh, really? And how old are you now? Eight. Wow. That's a long career you've had so far. Um, do you want to be a, a, a hockey player when you grow up? Yes, I, wa I want to be the next Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> so, your family is Italian? Yes. Do you know where they're from in Italy? Um, France. Can you tell us some Italian words? Chiusa la botta. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. What Who taught you that phrase that you just told us? My grandpa. Does he say that to you? A lot of times, yeah. He does. Does that mean that you, ma that you make a lot of noise? Yes. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Are you going to make a lot of noise on the ice tonight? Yes. <laughs> the young athletes were excited to watch their heroes so close up. Yet they could hardly wait for the Rangers to finish their game so that they could take over the ice. One minute, one minute, one minute, one minute! Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for tonight's Little Rangers. The players on the ice, we have a Westchester Stadium Academy located in Melbourne, New York. Let's meet tonight's roster. On the blue team, Anthony Capello. Aiden LaFucci, and in goal, Stefano Capasso. On the white team, Alex Frasco, Nicholas D'Elia, Jason DeSalvo. For the Rangers, the Rangers for Keith Hockey, for the next generation of Bronx Gold Blackhawks, the best of luck during the 2013-14 season. How about a nice Madison Square Garden applause for tonight's two Rangers? So, how was it out there? Good. I should have scored. I had a break. Like, I should have won it. I should have went. I should have, like, either got in closer or did a dig, but instead, I just tried to shoot top shelf and it went over the net. Well, it's kind of hard. You had, a, you had a quick game, huh? Well, yeah. It was pretty hard. Well, did, you, did you learn anything from this game? Yeah. So, how was it to be out there on the Rangers ice? Good. I didn't really get a lot of shots on me, so, um, But you played pretty well. Thank you. It felt good. And then blue team won. And scored, they scored two goals. So you're kind of disappointed, huh? Yeah. But you played a good game out there. Yeah. It's kind of rough on the Rangers ice. Yeah. It felt really good. Tell us about it. It was like I could just finally go on the Rangers ice. It, I can finally play in Madison Square Garden for my first time. And we at Italics look forward to next time. Maybe a follow-up in 2027. Up next, a list of forthcoming events taking place at the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute. Forthcoming events at the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute. February 27th, Finding the Mother Lode directed by Gianfranco Norelli and Suma Curian, followed by a post-screening discussion with the directors, led by Joseph Schorra of the Calandra Institute. And March 11th, Luigi Bonafini and Joseph Pericone read from Poets of the Italian Diaspora, a bilingual anthology. Events take place at the Calandra Institute. All events are free. For details, call 212-642-2094. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Italics. Tune in to our next episode of Italics, airing March 26th, for our special episode dedicated to Women's History Month. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.